Well, good morning to each of you again. Good to see you all here on the Sabbath morning. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to go to uh, two or three passages, if time allows us to, this morning, and uh, we're going to cover a good amount of ground. And what we're doing this morning is using three stories, hopefully three stories, if I don't get too, uh, too bogged down in only one of them, but we'll see how it goes. We're going to use two or three stories as case studies. So um, what we want to see in these stories, these are stories of real life people in real situations, and the one thread of commonality that links all three of these stories together is that all three of these stories happen in the church. Where does it happen? That's right. I don't mean in the building. I mean these are church people. These are religious people. These are believers. These are people following Jesus. Are you with me? That's what I mean. So we are looking at three different situations, and we're going to find, uh, we're going to mine them a little bit deeper than their externals. And we want to ask ourselves this question today. What rules our hearts? What's the question? What rules our hearts? Remember, these are religious people in a church setting, in a spiritual environment, just like you and I. That's the point of commonality that we see between these three stories. And just one more time, I just want to ask the Lord for his blessing, if you'll bow your heads. Father God, we go through the scriptures, we travel through them, we look at real stories, we look at real people in the midst of struggle, in the midst of temptation and sin, in the midst of following you, and we see so much of ourselves. Open our eyes, open our eyes that we will see ourselves in these stories, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Matthew chapter 20, and we're starting with verse 20, and it says the following. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons. Who's Zebedee's sons? Who's the son? Who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John, right? The sons of thunder. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand, the other on your left, in your kingdom. Interesting question. Interesting question. Our question is, what rules our hearts? What does her question tell us about what rules her heart? Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. You do not know what you ask. You do not know what you ask. Webster's paraphrase, you do not understand what you just revealed about your heart. When you opened your mouth and you asked that question, the words that you spoke were not merely give my sons positions on your right hand or on your left hand. What you spoke was an evidence of what rules your heart. What rules your heart? You can ask these questions. What do I want? What do I fear? What do I love? What do I want? What do I fear? What do I love? Those are the questions that, that, that reveal what rules, what governs your heart. What do I want? What do I fear? What do I love? What did she want? She wanted status. She wanted reputation. She wanted power. She wanted favor. She didn't just want the well-being of her children. She didn't just want the well-being of the nation because her two sons happened to be the best candidates for the job. They would exercise the greatest discretion. They would exercise the greatest love and compassion. These are sons of thunder. Are you with me? In other places of Scripture, they are called sons of thunder. Now, it is true that through the transformation, transformational power of Christ, John, who writes the Gospels, the, the gospel, right, is known as the beloved disciple. He went from a son of thunder to the meekest, to the mildest, to the closest to Jesus. Out of the twelve, there were three in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the two sons of thunder and their friend Peter. And out of those three, John became the closest to Jesus. His heart, as corrupt as it was, was most 
open and available to transformation. And thus he came ever closer into the presence of Jesus. He became the beloved disciple, the humble disciple, the disciple of love. When you read 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, you discover, and all the way through his own gospel, the gospel of John, you discover this theme of love, of love, of love. This is the brother. This brother and his brother, James and John, they were the ones that wanted fire to come down from heaven to destroy the Samaritans because they offended Jesus. That's why they were called the sons of thunder. They were ill-tempered. They were rash. They were radical in their thinking. They were zealous. They were, get up and do something. We don't need talk. We don't need prayer. We need action. They were those kind of people. So when the mother comes and asks Jesus, she's not asking from the purity of heart. She's not asking because there's absolutely, this is the best decision for the kingdom of God. This is the best decision for the people of God. These men are exercising wisdom and discretion. They have the heart of God. She wants prestige. She wants power. She wants that status in her family. The root of these evils is what we call the fear of man. The fear of man is either being afraid of man such that I forget that God is my defender and I bow, I compromise to avoid conflict with man or the fear of man is an inordinate respect and love for man. The desire to be loved, people pleasers, suffer from the sin of the fear of man. They do things to make others happy, sometimes Bad things, sometimes wrong things, sometimes good things that shouldn't be done because it feeds pride and it does other things. But they do it because they please man. They have the fear of man, not the fear of God. The first angel says, fear God and give glory to him. What rules your heart? What ruled this mother's heart, as well-meaning as it seemed, as defensive and as intelligent as it seemed in favor of her sons, it was a selfish desire that ruled her. The love of praise, the love of man, the love of power. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. You don't understand what drives you. The question you have asked has revealed the love of your heart. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? A stark contrast to the love of power. Stark contrast. Jesus is about to be crucified. He is about to die for humanity. Here is a woman begging for power over humanity. A stark contrast. You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Are you able to surrender self? Are you able to give everything for the well-being of others? Are you willing to suffer for, the, for, for those who irritate, who irk, who hurt you? Are you willing to lay down your life for your enemies? Are you willing to love to the point of death? These are religious men. These are men in the church. These are men aspiring to positions within the church, leadership within the church. The same wicked love of power, the same wicked fear of man, the same love of self that drives the corporate ladder, that drives the secular world, can drive those in the church. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am about to be baptized with? They said to him, we are able. We are able. They didn't get that, did they? <laughs> they didn't get it. Sure we are, but we don't really know what that is. We don't really understand what drives you, what moves you. Are we often like that with God? Yeah, God, I'll follow you. Yeah, God, I'll do what you want. Yeah, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Where does he want you to go? He wants you to go to the foot of the cross. He wants you to surrender self. He wants you to, to, to let go of these, of these internal sinful things, these warpings of our nature that drive us continually to do good things for bad reasons or to do bad things for good reasons. This confusion within, this deceitfulness of the human heart. He's not just asking us for our time, our talents, and our money. He's begging. He's pleading for our hearts. For our hearts. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, 
This is God incarnate. This is Jesus. This is the Almighty walking around in human flesh. Notice the stark contrast. The hungerings, the hankerings of the sinful human nature, desiring exaltation, desiring power, desiring prestige, all in the right context, in a church context, in a believing context. And what does Jesus say? The master of the church, the head of the church. He takes a place of subservience before the Father. He says, these things are not mine to give. I am I am content. I am content with whatever the will of God is. I am content with whatever He decides. I do not seek to rule according to my desires and my instincts. To sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Now, yeah, something interesting that happens. When the ten heard it, when the ten heard it, they were what? What does it say? Indignant, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Now, should they have been displeased? Let's be honest, should they have been displeased? Yes, they should have been displeased. Yes, what the brothers did was wrong. Yes, what the brother's mother did was wrong. There should have been an indignation. There should have been an anger. There should have been a displeasure with what took place. The challenge, though, is that they were that for all the wrong reasons. They were not unhappy because this was not according to the will of God. They were not unhappy because this was going to be a disservice to the people around them. They were not unhappy because this was going to hurt other people. They were unhappy, and we know this from the other records, because they wanted what those two brothers wanted. Does that make sense? They were angry at seeing their own sin in the two brothers. What displeased them was that they didn't get there first. What displeased them was that it wasn't them who were promoted. What rules our hearts? When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Then Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Position, power. And those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. It shall not be so in the church. It shall not be so among the church. A man who is hungry for power should not be in leadership. A man who gets high on ruling over others is not fit to rule over others. He says, this is how it is in the world, and you would expect that because there is no God in the world, as it were. People in the world, and when I'm using in the world, I'm talking about people who, who, who are outside of Christ. You can understand their inordinate desire for power. You can understand that they don't want to be on the bottom of the food chain. You would understand that their lives are not given in sacrifice for others. That self seeks to master them, and self seeks to master others. But within the community of faith, Jesus says, these things ought not to be so. We are not to be ruled by those base passions, the desire for supremacy, the exaltation, the looking at me, the power. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Our estimation of greatness is warped, according to Jesus. Our estimation of greatness is by the number of followers. Our estimation of greatness is by the strength of our influence. Our estimation of what it means to be great is how many people bow along the road while we walk. Jesus' estimation of greatness in the kingdom of heaven is the emptiness of soul, the surrendering of self, the willing to be anything and everything so as to serve the other. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many, the pouring out of self. I want you to jump over the chapter. Go to chapter 21. Chapter 21, and it's the story of the landowner. And he has two, he, he, he rents out his field, right? He rents out his field to some people to cultivate his grape, his vineyard and to harvest the grapes. And he sends, he sends for the produce. He sends for the profits. 
And what happens is that when he sends his servants, they misuse, they abuse, they mistreat them, they persecute them. He sends another group, the same thing happens. And finally, he decides that he will send the, his own son, right? Jump down to verse 37. Then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. What rules our hearts? This parable was spoken to the Jewish nation. More than that, this parable was spoken to the leaders of the Jewish nation. Our first case study were the disciples, the men of Jesus' own choosing around him, men upon whom he was going to build his church, men who were far from perfect, men who struggled with that carnal nature raising its head, men who Jesus had to turn to Peter at one time, remember, and say, when you art converted... When you are converted, he had been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. He had been hearing the teaching. He had been practicing. He had been in ministry. When you are converted, in other words, when self is dethroned, when the functional gods that rule our lives, that inform the way we make our choices, when they are dethroned, when you are converted to allow Jesus to rule the heart, when he sits upon the throne, when you are converted... Yeah, you have another picture. Also people in the religious community of faith. But these people are actively opposing Jesus. The first group are the people in the religious community who are actively walking with Jesus. And they are struggling. And they are failing. And they are weak. The quest to have Jesus on the throne. To understand what it means on a practical level of our daily life. Both of these groups struggled with that same question. The ones who were actively following Jesus. And those who were actively opposing Jesus. And both these groups are in the church. They see Jesus. The religious leaders recognize who he is. It says later on that they understood that these parables were spoken about them. And that's what made them even more angry. They had the same struggle as those disciples. They had the love of power. They had the fear of man. They wanted people to look at them. They wanted people to recognize them. They could not make way for the Savior. And you and I cannot make way for the Savior in our lives as long as we are governed by the fear of man, by the love of power, by the love of money, by prestige, by covetousness, by murderous thoughts. When you take the Ten Commandments and you look at them, they are not just ten external advices on how to live your practical life. They don't just cover the main behavioral aspects of life. Those Ten Commandments rightly understood the spirituality of the law. Mine down deep into our hearts. They cause us to question, what rules your heart? What rules your heart? The love of power led to murderous thoughts. Covetousness led to murderous thoughts. The external behaviors that you manifest are the warning signs. They are the, they are the symptoms of a far deeper disease, a disease that goes down into the depths of your heart. And Christianity is not merely about changing those externals. Christianity is about getting down into the heart. Christianity is about Jesus transforming the heart. Christianity is about coming to the place where I recognize that the problem with me is not that I do bad stuff. The problem with me is that I'm rotten to the core. The problem with me is that I am moved by unbelief, by false beliefs. I am moved by, by the inordinate love of things I shouldn't love in that way. That I have false gods sitting upon the throne. And the crazy thing is... Is. All of these people are in the church. All of this conflict that was happening between the believers who were trying to follow Jesus and those who were resisting Jesus was because none of them would relinquish the love of power. None of them would relinquish the love of self. It is impossible for people to be at war when at least one party is fully surrendered to Christ. Now it is possible for there to be persecution. Because persecution is one directional. Are you with me? There can be conflict in the sense of persecution. But there cannot be interpersonal conflict when at least one party in the conflict where there's two is surrendered to Christ. Where Christ governs his heart. Where self is dethroned. Where he's not in it for power. When he's not in it for money. When he's not in it for the fear of man. 
when the heart has been emptied of these things, when it has recognized it, when it chooses to turn away from it, when it cries out to the Savior, have mercy upon me, son of David. Take my heart, not just my circumstances, not just my behaviors, my heart. Take my heart. Teach me to love you like you have loved me. How have you loved me? You died on the cross for me. You emptied heaven for me. You went outside of your comfort zone for me. You, you, you left everything that was yours to seek me out. Teach me, Jesus, to love you like you have loved me. Teach me, Jesus, to love others the way you have loved me, the way you have loved them. Teach me to see my brethren as equals, not inferiors. Not inferiors that I have the right to rule over. Not inferiors that I have the right to abuse. Not inferiors that are rungs on a ladder to get me to where I want to be. Teach me to see others the way you see them, as so precious that I would rather sacrifice my life for them than use them and abuse them. Teach me, Jesus, to seek the cause of justice, not because of my selfish desire for revenge, not because I want to see someone suffer, but because I want to see them redeemed. In the midst of the quest for justice is the sacrificing of self for the well-being of others and for the well-being of the defenseless. Teach me to love others and to love the sinner. Teach me to seek restitution for wrongs. Teach me to seek restitution for wrongs that I have committed, to be there as a catalyst for restitution for others' wrongs, not because I I revel in the downfall of my enemy, not because I revel in lording my authority and my power over somebody else, but because I seek the redemption of the lost, because I love them like you have loved me. Lord, empty my heart of the perversity of the love of self. They turned on the Messiah. They rejected Jesus. There was no place in their homes. There was no place in their relationships. There was no place in their church for Jesus, the rightful heir, the Messiah. They intended to take the kingdom for themselves. That, by the way, is another one of the core motivators that rule us. My kingdom come. My will be done. The disciples grumbled against their fellow disciples. They complained. Why? Because they were hurt. Because their will was crossed. Because they didn't get what they wanted. Somebody else almost got what they intended to take for themselves. Did you know that in the Old Testament, grumbling was a, a sin punishable by death? I mean, we're talking up there with adultery. We're talking up there with homosexuality. We're talking up there with blasphemy. We're talking up there with honoring your father and your mother. All of those sins were punishable by grumbling. Grumbling, punishable by death. Why? Because grumbling says something fundamental about you. Grumbling says something about who rules your heart. Grumbling says not just that I don't like my circumstances. It says my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It says that God has done me injustice. It says that I am not treated like I deserve to be treated. It says that I am at the center of my universe. It says that nobody else is entitled to anything but me. Why do I grumble in the traffic? Something I have no control over. Why do I grumble in the traffic? Because I am entitled to an easy drive. I am entitled to a clear road. I, I, I. Why do I grumble? Why do I complain? Because my will is crossed. Punishable by death. It is a godless state of mind. It is a denial of God. It is putting myself in the place of God. The New Testament comes along and says, Count it all joy when various trials come your way. Not grumble your way. Why? Why do you count it all joy? Because I see God's fingerprints through the midst of my trials and my difficulties. These, these evils that are on the outside, that's what trials are. They're evils on the outside of me, right? They're evils that come at me. They are the difficulties of life that I didn't choose. Or maybe I might have, but I'm not necessarily. They are difficulties, either consequences of my wrongdoing or the consequences of some other idiot's wrongdoing. Are you with me? When those trials come upon me, those are the evils on the outside of me. We have no control over many of those trials. But you know what those trials do? They awaken the evil within me. 
so that my responses now are perverted by the carnal human nature. Yes, it is unjust. Yes, it is not fair. Yes, some of the things that happen to us that are far more significant than being stuck in a traffic jam over which I have no control. But some of these things, they are genuinely horrid. They are definitely, they seek, they need redress. They need justice to be served. But at the same time, how I respond to that is often very sinful. The disciples respond to a situation that, the, that, that James and John and the, and the mother have created. They didn't ask for it. They didn't go looking for it. How do they respond? They are greatly displeased. They become bitter. They start grumbling. They start complaining. They start infighting. It says that they were they had the same false gods, the same unbelief ruling their hearts as their compatriots did. Come with me to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Starting with verse 1. A certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. Which commandment is that? Which commandment is that? Stealing, covetousness, right? He kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. See, the problem here wasn't that Ananias didn't give everything from his land that he had sold to the church. It's not that he had to do that. The problem here is that Ananias was lying to the brethren. He thought he was only lying to the brethren, but he was lying to God. The problem was not that he didn't give 100%. There's no commandment in Scripture that says every time you sell something, you have to give all the money to the church, right? You have to give all the money to the mission of Christ. The problem was that Ananias wanted to look good what God's ruling his heart. The fear of man. The fear of man led to covetousness. The fear of man led to theft. The fear of man led to, 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 um, to vows being made that he was not intending to keep. He wanted to look good in front of the brethren. He wanted the prestige. He wanted the recognition. He wanted the, he wanted the, the power. He wanted the love and the praise. He wasn't willing to make the sacrifice. He was governed by selfishness. He was governed by covetousness. He was governed by the fear of man. He was governed, Jesus speaks about the love of riches as one of the, one of the key functional gods that rules so many people. We see the, fear, the, the, the love of riches in, at play with the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And he, and he says, what great thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus runs through the commandments. He says, these things I've done since my youth, only seeing the externals of the commandments, not understanding how the commandment speaks to the core of his being, to his heart. And then Jesus strikes right at the core of it. He goes from the behaviors right to the center of his heart. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take everything you've got and I want you to sell it. And I want you to give it to the poor. And then I want you to come and follow me. What Jesus was asking was, I want to be number one. I need to be the uh, first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. He said, it's only when you dethrone that functional God, it's only when you dethrone that love of riches, that mammon, when you, when you take it off the throne, then you will be in a position to follow me. The saddest story in Scripture, the man turns from Jesus and decides to cling to the love of riches. He decides that his precious God is more precious to him than the true God. And he forsakes Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira, same mistake. If not the love of riches, certainly the fear of man for Ananias and Sapphira. And I wonder what it is for you and I. I wonder what it is, this, this fear of man, this, this love of prestige, this recognition, this desire to be seen and to be, to, to be, to be loved and to be, 
spoken of and to be adored and to, be, to have fame. I wonder, I wonder how that manifests amongst us. I wonder how that manifests amongst us. We've spoken about people pleasers, haven't we? People who do things to please others even although there is harm that's coming from this. Harm to themselves or harm to others. A compromise on principle. People pleasers have the fear of man, not the fear of God. What, what, what about, what about can, our, can our physical deportment demonstrate the fear of man? Can the way we dress demonstrate the fear of man? Can, can the clothes we put on tell people, communicate to people that we want to be, that we are superior? Do the clothes that we put on, can they... Can they